Super Bowl Sunday is a time to party. And I got to thinking about parties this week, and I thought about a birthday party that my son uh, was invited to several years ago. He, he uh, was invited to a party, family in our church, uh, Neely and Sabrina Carter. Uh, they have all girls, and their middle girl, Laura, uh, was in elementary school at the time. Her and Hayden are good friends. She's a teenager now. And uh, they invited Hayden to the birthday party. And Neely called me and said, just so you know, it's a princess birthday party. And so I'm just letting you know ahead of time. Uh, it's a princess theme. It's going to be all girls. He'll be the only boy there, but Laura really wants him to come. And so I was like, hey, we'll be there, man. If Laura wants him to be there, we'll be there. So we pull up to this party, and it's Laura and all the girls from her class. And, uh, and, and so we get out, and, and I'd already told Hayden, hey, buddy, you're going to be the only boy there. It's a princess theme party. Uh, just go with it, all right? Let's go because Laura's your friend. And so we get there, and the first thing they do is they're going to make princess crowns. And so they have all these pink foam craft crowns uh, that you can get in the crafting section at Walmart with all these little jewels to glue onto them. And they pass them out and they get to Hayden and Neely goes, oh Hayden, we got something special for you. And he gives them one of those foam craft baseball caps that you can get in the craft section at Walmart with a bunch of sports stickers to put on it. And he's like, we got something just for you. And then it came time to have the cake. And they brought out all these cupcakes with pink icing and every one of them had a little fake ring on it little princess ring except for when they got to Hayden they had a cupcake with blue icing on top of it was a ninja turtle ring and we got a special cupcake for you and at the end of the party uh, they handed out gift bags and when they handed out gift bags <coughs> excuse me they hand out these pink translucent bags with fake jewelry and pink bubble gum and uh, bubbles and all these things that little girls like and then they got to Hayden they gave him a blue bag and it was full of Hot Wheels cars and candy that he liked and bouncy balls and it was so incredible because of how much thought they put into my son being at the party. I was blown away at how they went out of their way to show us hospitality. There's a word for what they did. It's called hospitality and the Bible actually talks a lot about hospitality. The Bible has a ton to say about hospitality. And so as we wrap up our series this morning, the main thing, we're going to talk about hospitality. So if you have a Bible, open it up to Hebrews chapter 13 or turn on your app and go to Hebrews chapter 13. That's in the New Testament. If you're new to church or new to the Bible, the Bible is divided up into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is a record of the history and movement of God before the coming of His Son Jesus into the world. And everything in the Old Testament points forward that one day God will send a rescuer to rescue people from their sins. The New Testament is the story of the rescuer, the Messiah, the Son of God. His name is Jesus, and the New Testament records his birth, his life, his death on a cross, his resurrection. That means he came back to life, and the beginnings of his early church. Hebrews is in the New Testament. Uh, it was a letter written to the church, and, uh, and it, by the way, if you don't own a Bible, if you don't have a Bible, uh, we'd love to give you one this morning. So if you stop by the Connection Center on the way out, we have a Bible for free for you. If you don't have one today, you can follow along on the screen. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. The Bible says more about hospitality. Peter, a disciple of Jesus, writes this in 1 Peter 4, 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. He says, listen, show hospitality to one another and don't complain about it. Don't complain about having to show hospitality to people. Paul wrote a letter to the church in Rome that became part of our Bible. Paul was a follower of Jesus who started these churches and would write letters back to them to remind them how to live. And in Romans chapter 12, Paul is actually giving a list of ways that we show love to people. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 13, he simply says this, practice hospitality. That that's a way that we can show love to people is we practice hospitality. Well, what is hospitality? What is hospitality? Well, here's the dictionary definition of hospitality. It's the generous and friendly treatment of visitors, guests, or strangers. That's hospitality. Here's how we simply define it at Timberridge Church, just to make it real simple. A simple definition of hospitality is making people feel welcomed and wanted. Making people feel welcomed and wanted. Well, why would we talk about hospitality in a series where we're talking about helping people find and follow Jesus, that that's the main thing we're put on earth for. Well, one of the best ways to help people find and follow Jesus is to show them hospitality. It is to show them hospitality. Here's what the Bible says in Romans 15, 7. It says, Therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. That when we welcome 
people, when we, we're kind to people, when we show hospitality to people, we're actually bringing glory to God. So if God's word says that treating people with hospitality, that helping them feel welcome and, and wanted is a priority, then how do we do that? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. How can I help people feel welcome and wanted? How can we as a church family practice hospitality toward the people in our community? I want to give you three super practical ways that you and I can do this. The first one is this. When I invite people, I help them feel welcome and wanted. When I invite people, I help them feel welcome and wanted. Look at the, at the Bible at John chapter 1. John chapter 1 is the the first story of Jesus calling his disciples to follow him. Here's what it says in verse 35. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, there's the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying. And they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and he told him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip, and he said to him, Come, follow me. And Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. And Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, We found the very person that Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph of Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Here's why. Because it it shows us an encounter with these young disciples and how it changed their life when they met Jesus. Here's what happened. These guys are going through life. They're fishing. They're fishermen. They're hanging out. They're going through life. They're doing their thing. And then they have an encounter with Jesus. And immediately, once they have an encounter with Jesus, immediately they want to go and get their friends to experience what they've experienced. They, they meet Jesus. The Bible says that they hung out with Jesus all afternoon, that they spent the day with him, and they had such an experience with Jesus. They knew he was the Messiah. They called him the Messiah. They knew he was the son of the living God, God in the flesh. And here was their response. They got to meet Jesus. They found out he was the Messiah. They experienced him, and their immediate response was, we got to go get our friends and family to experience this too. We've got to go get our friends and family to experience this too. They immediately start inviting others that they know to follow Jesus too. Why? Because there's power in an invitation. There's power in an invitation. Think about the last time you got an invitation. Check the mail. You're going through the mail. Bill, 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 political ad, political ad, car advertisement, bill, political ad, Chunking it all in the trash, right? Even the bills, all of it in the trash. Invitation. Invitation, I I got invited to something. You open that invitation up. Maybe it's a birthday party invitation. It's a wedding invitation. It's an invitation to a shower. You open it up because an invitation says that there's a place for you to belong. An invitation says that people want you somewhere. An invitation says that you're welcome somewhere. That's what an invitation does. It lets us know that we're welcome somewhere. A couple years ago, I was uh, going through my email one morning. (coughs) <coughs> and I get an email from this guy named Jack, who's a part of one of the organizations that our church partners with. And he sent me an email and he said, hey, uh, one of the things our organization does is we, we want to make sure that we provide rest and refreshment for pastors. And, and, uh, and so we, our organization, would like you and your wife to go on a cruise to Alaska. And I was like, okay, what's the catch? And he's like, no catch. We pay for everything. It's all expense paid, cruise to Alaska. All you have to do is say yes. 
Well, you better believe we said yes to that invitation, right? We got to go to Alaska for free. Now, every time I get an email from Jack, I open that sucker up. I'm not deleting Jack's emails, right? Jack calls my phone, I answer. He might just be inviting me somewhere cool. Why? Because we love to get invited somewhere. We love to, to, to go to places where people want us and we're welcome. And here's the truth. Sometimes what people need isn't another explanation of Jesus. Especially in the South. There's still a remnant of the Bible Belt in the South. Sometimes what people need isn't to hear the story of Jesus again. They don't need another explanation of Jesus. They need to experience the power and presence of Jesus in a real way. And that's why we give out invite cards. That's why we encourage people to invite their friends and neighbors and family to church. Because sometimes we don't need another explanation of Jesus. We need to experience the power of Jesus for ourselves. Sometimes you come to church, you're like, great. They put another one of those baseball card sleeves packed full of those invitations in my chair. What am I supposed to do with these? Hand them out. Invite people. Because you never know when a personal invitation could be life-changing to the person you hand it to. You never know. Some of you in this room, your life was changed because someone invited you to a place where you could experience the power of Jesus. You know, it never, it never, we, we don't, we've never went a month in the history of our church where I haven't met at least one person who is here for the first time that is their first time to ever be in church in their lives. Adults. And I'll go up and I'll, I'll meet them and I'll say, hey, I, my name's Nick. I, I'm the pastor here. I don't think we've had the chance to meet. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk for a second. They're like, yeah, it's my first time here. I'm like, oh, it's your first time here? Uh, first time at Timber Ridge? And they're like, no, it's my first time in church. It's my first time in church. And I'm like, what do you mean your first time in church? I've never been in church before. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. That's awesome. I'm glad this is your first time. And I think you're going to have a great experience this, this morning. Uh, can I ask you, why did you, why did you come here today? Well, they'll name somebody. So-and-so invited me. So you've never been to church before in your life, and -and so-and-so invited you. And then I'll always ask them this, well, why haven't you gone to church before? And this is what they'll say. I've never been invited. I've never been invited. It's crazy to me that the world we live in, the majority of people that we invite to church don't aren't like oh I'm anti God I'm anti religion I'm an, I don't want to I don't like music I don't like you know I don't like donuts no like they like all that stuff right but they've never been invited they've never been invited there's power in a personal invitation here's what happens when I invite someone to church I say hey you're welcomed and wanted at our church that's what an invitation does uh, it says hey our church is a place you can belong and guess what if they're welcome and wanted in our church then that means they're welcome and wanted in the kingdom of God. If, if our church is a place that they can belong, then that means the family of God has a place for them and they can belong too. You see, when I invite people, I help them feel welcome and wanted. The second thing is this, when I serve people, I help them feel welcome and wanted. When I serve people, I help them feel welcome and wanted. Jesus modeled this for us. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, it says, For even the Son of Man, that's a nickname for Jesus, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here's what Jesus knew about serving people. When we serve people, here's what we're saying to the people we serve. You matter. You matter. When you and I use our gifts, our time, our energy, our talents, our skills to serve other people, we are saying to the people we serve, you matter. You matter to us, you matter to me, and you matter to Jesus. When we serve people, we're letting people know that they matter. We read 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9, uh, when we started off this morning, uh, where it says, uh, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. But here's how Peter continues that thought process. In the very next verse, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, he says, listen, offer hospitality to one another, and then he tells us how to do it. He says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. So Jesus models serving for us, and then we're instructed to serve others. Why? Because when we serve others, we're letting them know that they matter. 
that they matter to God, that there's a place for them in the family of God, that they're welcomed and wanted in the kingdom of Jesus. And there are so, 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 so many people that call Timberridge Church home that model this, that they're serving and they're using their energy and their time and their gifts and, and their talents to serve others from the parking lot to the kids' ministry to the youth ministry to our creative arts teams to the cafe to greeters. I mean, all kinds of teams that people are serving using their gifts so that we can create a place where people feel welcomed and wanted. You know how I know that? Because we do this thing called a first-time guest survey. When people come for the first time, if they fill out a little card, we send them a text message and we say, hey, could you take 60 seconds and fill out this survey so that we can better serve our community? And it's four questions. And two of those questions are, what did you like first? Or what did you notice first? And what did you like best? You know what they never say? They never say the preaching. I wish that would change, but they never say it. They never, all oh, the preaching. I think it's the best preaching around, but nobody ever says that on the survey. Uh, here's what they say. How friendly the people were at the door. The people in the parking lot smiled and gave my kid a high five. I went in the cafe to get some coffee and donuts, and the people were laughing and, and had a good conversation with me. Every week, what they're saying is people serving in the local church helped me belong and know that I mattered. That's what they're saying. And week after week after week, it's the same thing. Why? Because when we serve people, we let them know that they matter, that they're welcome and wanted in the kingdom of God. So here's what I want to challenge you to do. If you're not serving, if you're not using your time and energy and talent to serve on a ministry team in the local church, we get got a great opportunity coming up next Sunday, 5 p.m., football's over. Next Sunday, 5 p.m., right here at, at the church, we're going to have a volunteer team night. It's for everyone who serves on a team or anyone who's interested in starting to serve on a team. We're going to have a great time. We're going to have a meal. We're going to hang out. We're going to have fun. And so if you would like to do that, you can take that connection card and just check that box that says serving on a ministry team. We would love to have you join a team. Why? Because when we serve others... We let them know they're welcomed and wanted in the kingdom of God. And then number three is this. When I'm kind to people, I help them feel welcome and wanted. When I'm kind to people, I help them feel welcomed and wanted. Here's what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. It says, be kind to each other. Be kind to each other. It's a forgotten art in our culture. We want to be right, and we've forgotten how to be kind. We want to be winning, and we've forgotten how to be loving. Be kind to each other. Colossians 3, 12 says, Since God chose you to be the holy people He loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Paul, the follower of Jesus, who wrote both of these letters to the church, he says, listen, as followers of Jesus, we are called to be kind. We live in such a me first, my way, I want to be right, and I want it right now culture that we've almost forgotten how to be kind to people. But kindness matters because kindness lets people know that they matter. Kindness matters because kindness helps people know that they matter. So for the majority of our kids' school life, uh, Johanna, my wife, has been the one to drop them off at school. Uh, now I, I'm typically the one to drop them off at school the most, but she uh, has been the one in the past to drop them off at school. And so uh, when she drops them off every day, we say the same thing. And uh, it's this, it's be kind, be strong, be brave, be you. We say it to both of our kids every single time they're dropped off. Joe will say, uh, she'll drop off Hadley at Chamberlain. She'll say, Hadley, remember, be kind, be strong, be brave, be you. We drop a Hayden off at Hook. We say, Hayden, remember, be kind, be strong, be brave, be you. So when I started dropping off at school, I do the same thing, uh, except for I add it a little because I have to make it my own. And so when I drop my son Hayden off, I'll say, Hayden, be kind, be strong, be brave, be you. And then I'll look in the mirror. He's in the back seat. I look in the mirror and I say, and if you're going to be in a letter in the alphabet, he goes, be a G for gangsta, right? You got to be a gangsta. And so, uh, and then he gets out. Hadley still hasn't picked up what we're doing there. So when I ask her, she's like, be an H for Hadley. I'm like, yeah, baby, you're cute. Go get him. And uh, why do we remind our kids to be kind? Because it's a forgotten virtue. But kindness will make a difference in the lives of other people. Kindness will make an impact in the lives of other people. You may not be the smartest person in the room. You can be the kindest. You may not be the most gifted person in the room. You can be the kindest. 
You may not be the most intelligent person in the room. You can be the kindest. You may not have the most energy or the most skill, but you can have the most kindness. Kindness changes people's lives. Kindness makes a difference. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, we read verse 2 already about hospitality, but verse 1 says this, let brotherly love continue. It's the same word used for kindness. Let kindness continue. Don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. And there's a direct connection between kindness and hospitality. In Titus chapter 3, verse 4 through 6, the Bible says, But when God, our Savior, revealed His kindness and love, He saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. When Jesus went to the cross and He was crucified for the sins of humanity, He demonstrated for us what kindness looks like. When Jesus went to the cross and he gave his life so that I could be forgiven of my sin and so that you could be forgiven of your sin, so that we could be made right with God, so that we could come back to the family of God. That's what the cross did. The cross was the ultimate act of kindness because Jesus gave his life on the cross so that we could become a part of the kingdom of God. He gave his life on the cross so that we could be welcomed back into the family of God, that we no longer had to stay far away from God. We could be a part of his family because... Because of the kindness of Jesus. So why is this hospitality thing so important? Well, here's why, and then we're going to be done. Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You were on the outside. He says this, he says, you lived in this world without God and without hope. I want you to think about our culture. I want you to think about our world. I want you to think about what you've read online in the last week, what you've seen on the news in the last week, what you read in the paper, what you watch on TV there was ever a culture that could be characterized without God and without hope, it's ours. If there was ever a society that that, that they could pinpoint and say, this society is without God and without hope, it's ours. We live in a broken world full of hurt and heartache, pain and hopelessness. You live in this world hope. Look at what the next verse says. But, but now you have been unified, you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Paul is saying, listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, you used to be an outsider, and now you're inside the kingdom of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, you too used to live in a world without God and without hope. Your world was full of hopelessness and brokenness. But because Jesus went to the cross, he's welcomed you into the family of God as a son or daughter of the living God. Paul's reminding the church in Ephesus, listen, don't forget about the outsider because you too used to be an outsider and Jesus made a way for you to become part of the family. And so our job as followers of Jesus is to take the mission that Jesus started and to take it to our world and go, you don't have to stay outside the kingdom of God. There's a place for you in the kingdom of God too. You don't have to stay far away from God. You can come into the family of God and you can be a son and daughter of the living God too. And the way we do that is through hospitality. It's through creating lives and homes and relationships and churches where people who are far from God living in brokenness and hopelessness can look and go, I bet I could be welcomed in that place too. I bet they want me there too. I bet I could belong there too so that people outside the family of God could see by the way that we serve and the way that we invite and the way that we love and the way we practice kindness that even though I'm an outsider there's a place for me in that family too 
So we practice hospitality so that every person, no matter their past, no matter their mess, no matter their mistakes, no matter their present struggles, would know that there's a seat at the table for them in the family of God.